So let's begin with that first question that I have, what is executive function? So as I said earlier, it's an umbrella term for all of those complex cognitive processes that control flexible goal-directed behavior, and, the, and our emphasis in the flexibility. Cognitive flexibility in our work we see as key, and we've actually shown that in many of our, our studies as well. Um, and the second thing is coordination and synthesis of multiple processes and subskills. So it's the ability to pull together different pieces of information, to synthesize them, and to integrate. Um, we also know that executive function is controlled by the frontal and prefrontal cortex. Um, and actually the sort of aspects of the parietal <laughs> lobe that are also involved in executive function um, processes. And the analogy that, that I use in, um, in talking about executive function is that of a Rubik's Cube. And the reason I use this is to, is to point out that the, the, the processes are interconnect so closely that we, that we cannot see them as separate. I think people often want to see these as separate processes, whereas in fact, they, in, they are, if you, uh, if you impact one, if you affect one, if you're teaching to one, you're actually often affecting and teaching to all of these processes. So goal setting, um, sh cognitive flexibility of shifting, memorizing, the working memory pieces, organizing and prioritizing, and self-regulation, self-monitoring are the key processes that we, that we see as important. And the, the, the model that we use is this one of a clogged funnel, that we are living in, a, in an age when information is coming into the brain constantly and rapidly. And so many of us as adults, as well as the students that we work with, our, all our kids, are on overload a large amount of, time, of the time. And so what happens is that information gets, it's coming into that funnel, and if kids do not have approaches and strategies for setting goals that are realistic, goals for themselves that are realistic and doable. We talk about doable goals. That they, if, they are not, if they don't have strategies for thinking flexibly, for shifting approaches, when something doesn't work, trying it a different way and not getting stuck, for organizing and prioritizing information, figure out what's important, what's salient, what can I ignore for remembering information, accessing working memory. It's that working memory being able to hold information in their heads, as with mental computation. And then self-monitoring and checking. That's the self-regulation piece. Um, in all areas, not only the cognitive, but it, as you were just heard, hearing from Michelle, the social, the, in terms of the social environment, in terms of the cognitive aspects of the learning environment. When kids have all of these strategies in place, then that information can more easily get through that funnel and not get clogged, and that's what we're going to talk about today. So, as we see, as I said as well, executive function is the connector between with effort, with attention, and with emotional regulation, and so it, it sort of interacts. These these sort of other these connect with one another, and when kids don't have those executive function processes, sorry, I don't know why that went on, moved on. Um, then they, it can lead to an emotional, sh emotional shutdown or anger or frustration as we have in this, as you see in this quote. So this is Ben, a 13 year old, and this is a kid who I'm gonna talk about right through my presentation. This is when he was in seventh grade and he had been struggling since fourth grade. He'd done very well up till fourth grade in school. He was getting high, he was a shining light. He had, a, he had good grades when they were graded, of course. And he was doing well. And in fourth grade, he started having difficulty. Seventh grade, he turned and he said, and I got a big assignment I didn't understand. I got so angry because I just spent an hour staring at a blank Word document and I couldn't figure out how to start. It was really tough. So that's the connection I've just shown you. You see that issue is he doesn't have the strategies to get started. And you'll hear more about this whole writing process from Tony Bashir and Bonnie Singer, um, Singer in one of the, it, tomorrow. Um, so he couldn't, he, he couldn't get started and, and he shuts down, that, that funnel is clogged. He's sitting and he's staring at that blank screen, that's this clog that I talk about. Um, and, and in fact, this was his approach to writing. He says, I sit down to work, my mind feels like a blizzard, I grab an idea, if I can think of three good sentences, I go with it, if not, I find another idea. So it's like, okay, I just grab it, I put it together, there's no planning, there's no organizing, there's no prioritizing, there's no systematic. Um, approach 
to, um, to that process, to that writing process. And so he becomes angry. So you see that emotional regulation coming into play because he's frustrated. He's not angry at the world, he's angry with himself. He's angry at the fact that he has to do this. He's angry at the fact that he has to do homework. And of course he explodes with his mom, usually his parents. So the whole, the whole um, cycle begins. So the question that I'd like to you to keep in mind as I talk through these issues um, for this next hour is why has Ben struggled in school since fourth grade? How would you teach Ben to unclog the funnel if he was one of your students? And then how would you help to reduce Ben's frustration with academic work? Um, not easy to solve. So if we scaffold that in relation to the next question, why do these executive function difficulties have such a major impact on students' learning in our 21st century classrooms? Why has this become the hot topic the last few years? Why has it become a bigger and bigger issue? Um, and of course, there are fads in education. As we know, it's a pendulum. The things swing back and forth. From our point of view, this has always been an issue. We're now talking about it. We're now seeing the, the overload that kids are experiencing, but it's really exacerbated. And it's exacerbated by this issue that kids are in overload, and so are we as adults. There's so much technology. It, it, technology has, made it, has aggravated it significantly. There's information being thrown at students um, in different forms. Um, no, they're no longer using textbooks that are pre-organized. They're now having to get information off the internet. Many kids don't know what's relevant and what's not relevant. They don't know how to sift and sort. They don't know how to prioritize. They don't know how to organize. They grab information, often change the words. So many kids are now being, um, being told in school that they plagiarized, and they have no idea. They, they, from their point of view, they didn't plagiarize. They just wrote something. They just took something off the internet and changed a little bit. In their mind, that was doing the right thing. So there's a lot of pressure. The pace of learning is sped up. There's a lot of emphasis on independent learning. Kids in first grade are getting complex projects. And I hear parents sitting at the soccer field saying, I'm so relieved we have no homework this weekend. They have a first grader. Um, so there's pressure not, uh, you know, on everyone. And this is, it's, it, it makes absolutely no sense. Um, and the issue is that we're not teaching kids some of these processes, this metacognitive awareness, and some of these processes that are important for life, that are important for them to sort of get through this trajectory this, uh, call, this time period called school, and that you know, would help in, in different forms, in different kinds of schools like that Sam was referring to, to earlier. And so these executive function processes underlie all aspects of academic work, reading comprehension, written language, math problem solving, summarizing and note taking, long term projects, studying, test taking. Um, it, because kids are often faced with these these processes, especially from fourth grade onwards, and there's a su an assumption, which we were talking about on the panel, Sam mentioned that, that they are going to just be able to imbibe, from the, from the ether, they're going to know how to summarize, they're going to know how to take notes, they're going to know how to study. But until we give them that executive function strategy toolbox, they do not. Some kids need this explicitly taught. Most kids do. Not everyone. Some kids can, do seem to just imbibe it from their environment. But most kids really need it to be systematically taught, and we've shown this in some of our studies. All students need this, not only students with uh, problems. And so they need the strategies, and then they go from the sense of being frantic to the sense of calm. Um, and so this is sort of the framework for teaching these strategies. We want calm students. That changes the social environment for teachers, too. So the model that we use is this one I showed to you at the end of the panel, which is that we need to teach kids this metacognitive awareness so they can think about how they think and they can learn about how to learn. And when we build the metacognitive awareness, then we, lay, then we teach the executive function strategies. And as I said, uh, in many of our programs, we also use peer coaching, peer mentoring, it's an additional component. This is part of our SMARTS program. Um, and a lot of the strategies I'm going to talk about in the next um, half hour are actually included, are, could be our aspects of our SMARTS program. So if you go online uh, you decide to sort of become part of that SMARTS community, most of this is available in a very structured uh, 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 way to, for you. 
So the first question is, how do we foster metacognitive awareness and self-understanding in students like Ben? Ben really needs to understand why he's struggling, um, because otherwise that frustration anger just builds. Um, and as I mentioned, so we do have this as part of our program. And actually SMARTS, people keep asking what SMARTS stands for. SMARTS stands for Strategies, Motivation, Awareness, Resilience, Talents and Success. And those are all components that we try, all the processes that we try to build through our program. So that students at the end of it, so we're dealing with whole children as a whole child um, who can grow in all of these areas. So coming back to Ben, now he's in ninth grade. I showed you sort of a quote from him from when he was in seventh grade and a struggle that he'd been having since fourth grade. And in ninth grade he says, I was trying so hard. So of course he's in high school now. Everyone else got A's. I got a C. I couldn't believe it. Was I stupid? So this issue we talked about earlier, the kids internalize it as, am I stupid or am I lazy? Um, I've seen this for so many years. I've seen college students. I've, I always remember the story. A college student, 146 IQ, who came into my office. He just dropped out of college and he's queered. Only one question. Am I stupid or am I lazy? That was his question. And of course he was neither. The issue was he had issues with executive function and... Um, couldn't manage with the workload until he developed strategies and that turned things around for him. So we need to promote um, Ben's self-understanding about how he learns, how he thinks, how his strengths and weaknesses affect his learning and what strategies work best for him. Those are the keys and that's sort of that metacognitive framework. So in terms of fostering metacognition, we need to foster this in every student, in every classroom, across all the grades in the entire school, and we need to build a community of students to understand how they learn and who value learning strategy, and the issue is the how. So we sort of use a number of very um, of, of, of approaches which are very easy to implement in any classroom. First of all, giving kids strengths and challenges with checklists, and they, could, they generate these themselves, or you can give them a checklist to check off. So you don't need to look at the details here, but just the little red checks are where are his strengths, what he views as his strengths, and the, the diamonds are just areas of weakness that he sees. He thinks he sees himself as a good reader and good at working, that he works hard, that he learns new strategies, but he sees himself as weak. Even he recognizes that he can't organize his ideas. When he writes, he can't organize his time, he can't organize his belongings. He, um, he has trouble when he takes notes, he has trouble paying attention in class, all of these areas. So then we ask our students to develop what we call a, a Venn diagram, just what, the, what is my learning profile, what are my strengths, what are my weaknesses. Um, so he sees himself as working hard, remembering things for tests as a strength, learning new strategies, as I said. And then the weaknesses he lists out on the Venn. And once kids frame this out themselves, they begin to sort of see like, oh, those are the areas I need to improve in. So it doesn't, it's really challenges. We often say to call it your challenges. So these are the areas that I need to improve on and I can improve on these if I have these strategies. These are not areas that I just give up on. So it begins to make it more manageable and therefore you're beginning to start that process of what we call empowering the student to learn how to learn. So, the second piece of building metacognitive awareness is to get teachers and students to recognize whether or not they see, them, they see the students um, similarly. So, so in Ben's case, he said, well, my teacher said I wasn't trying and wasn't putting in the effort. They said I had the ability but not the desire. Remember, he said I was working so hard and I thought, why did I only get a C when all my friends were getting A's? So he sees himself as putting in the effort. My guidance counselor, and this is true, told me I would never even get a job flipping burgers at McDonald's. Now imagine a kid in ninth grade who's been told that by his guidance counselor and he's really frustrated. Well obviously there's going to be a point at which he stops where he gives up too. So we have to build that metacognitive awareness but we also have, have to help teachers to also recognise to, um, to um, see the, the, what the what similarities and differences are between their perceptions and their students' perceptions. So we've developed a system called the Metacog, a series of questionnaires. We've been using it since 2004. It's, it's, we've sort of had multiple publications with us. The first question is called the Motivation, Effort and Resilience Survey, which is a brief survey for kids, for students to complete um, about sort of how they perceive their effort in school. 
strategy use survey for students. Then we have teacher questionnaires, like the teacher perceptions of students' effort. And this is the same, same items as the students rate themselves. And then we compare students' and teachers' ratings. Um, and it's very uh, illuminating because it can help teachers to recognize where, where the gaps are between their views of the student and the student's views and of him or herself. So to give you some examples on the stratus with Ben, so these are just four out of the 20 items. I have trouble breaking down my homework into smaller manageable parts. He says, yeah, he has trouble. He rates himself one on a five-point scale. When I'm learning something new, I connect it to something I already know. He says, no, I'm pretty good at that. I rate myself a four. I have trouble organizing my thoughts before I write. Yeah, I'm having trouble with that. On many days, I forget to hand in my homework. True, I don't do. I, I do my homework and I forget it. So those are some of the items. So that begins to that process of being a cognitive awareness. You're getting him to actually sit and think about how, what his issues are. Um, and then, and then this is in the uh, when teachers rate him. So the me versus the tipsy. So the teachers are ready. So it, um, Ben's Ben's response is, yeah, I'm a hard worker. And the teacher says, no, he's not. So there's a discrepancy of three. This is on a five-point scale. Doing well in school is important to me. He says, yeah, very important. I rate myself a four. Teacher rates him a one. Like, he couldn't care about school. Um, I spend as much time as needed to get my work done. He says, absolutely. And the teacher says he doesn't spend any time at all. Discrepancy four. I keep working even when the work is difficult. He says, he, he says yes, I do. And the teacher says, no. You can see the discrepancy. So they have totally from, this is from a different planet, right? They have totally different views. This is the same to the same kid. He's caught in this, um, and so is the teacher, really. So this information, these questionnaires, when we use them in schools and when teachers use them, our point is that this can be very helpful for your report cards, for your parent conferences, and most importantly, if you give it at the beginning of the year and the end of the year, to, for you to help frame your teaching in relation to the student. And we have some of some schools um, a school in Connecticut, for example, where the principal's been using this for many years. She actually has a whole, she collects these, she has, a, and she, she looks, she checks these, the alignment between these, between our quest the questionnaires on every student, um, every quarter, and then she pulls the teachers in and says, look, there's a huge discrepancy between the student's view and your view, um, and so we need to understand this. Yeah, good question. I'll, I'll sort of try and address those in the question and answer session. Um, but just to briefly answer, answer that, which was how do you convince the teacher um, that, that the student really is trying? It's the questionnaires. I mean, they're pretty obvious. This is why. This is the purpose for using this kind of system, because it tells a story. It's not just guesswork. It's like this is how the students view themselves. Now, kids, as we know, and we also know this from research that we've done and others have done in the field, kids often overrate their performance um, on a rating scale. There. And it's not delusion, it's, that the, it's their perceptions, but very often, um, and then you can, question, you can question, well, what's realistic? Is that really that they're overrating themselves? And sometimes it's not, it's their perceptions. The issue is perception. The issue is what's the perception of the student versus what's the perception of the teacher versus what's the perception of the parent? And we need to bring them all together to align. So actually in a study that we, I'll tell you more towards the end, in a study where we've implemented our SMARTS program in a school, 400 students in an intervention and control group, what we found is that many of the students in our intervention, we, we were receiving all these smart strategies that the teachers were teaching. Over the course of the year, some of the students' ratings went down on these questionnaires, and we view that as fantastic. In other words, what they're saying is, I was overrating myself. I really wasn't being as strategic. I wasn't being as flexible as I thought I was. Now I realize. So that's a piece of it. So it gets to... Um, and so I would really encourage you to use, you know, any systems. You can develop your own. You can use this kind of system. But we find it very helpful in the schools that we have that are using it. Find it very helpful as well. And it's not. It's not like this huge le lengthy. St the questionnaires for the students take about 45 minutes for all three questionnaires. I'll take questions during the question. Pardon. Um, around third, fourth grade, kids have to be aware, but we do actually, we have a smiley face, I'll show you, and so we, we actually use it, we use this clinically with even 
first, second graders pieces of it. You can use it as an interview, a teacher or a special ed. You can use it across the grades. So some of the questions are these. The end of these questionnaires are qualitative information. Like as a student, I think I am. So you can see as a smiley face. Uh, so how would you describe yourself as a student? I could do a lot better if I tried. How do you think your teachers would describe you? Very good, except I only put work in some of the time. And how do you think your parents would describe you? Good. If he could try more and put more effort in. And then his comments about himself are, I think if I had more motivation, I would be a stronger student. Okay? And the teacher's comment is, Ben is unmotivated and apathetic. Now, this is Ben when he was younger. Okay? So, in other words, um, he... Um, there are pieces where he's saying, I know I'm motivated, but I know I need to work harder. I don't quite know how to work harder. Everyone else is saying, um, and, I, and that's how do kids say I need more motivation? I mean, what does it mean to be, think I need to be more motivated? It's a, it's, a, it's a label that's applied from the teachers and the parents, saying if you are motivated or if you tried hard, that's why we've developed, the, that's was the framework for developing the me and the tipsy, motivation and effort. When we talk about effort, what do we mean when we say, when teachers say to a kid, and it's not only it's usually parents, you should work harder. If you just worked harder, you'd be fine. Well, it's not a matter of working hard. There's no such thing. Everyone has a different view of effort, and that's why we develop these questionnaires to get at how do kids perceive their effort, how do students perceive, I mean, how do parents perceive their effort, how do teachers perceive their effort. We have an effort rating on report cards. What do we mean by it? So it's... It's all of it, and what we talk about is focused effort and strategic effort. You need the strategies to use, to apply the appropriate amount of effort. It's not just work hard in terms of time, it's work strategically. So, um, so we've talked about, um, and I'm really just giving you sort of the, a broad brush in terms of metacognition. We've talked about Venn diagrams, we've talked about using these questionnaires like our metacog, now, the third piece that we talk about in all of our work is strategy reflection sheets. And if there's one thing you can take back on Monday morning, I'm always emphasizing this, I really think it's easy, it's doable in classrooms, it's strategy reflection sheets. Get kids to start thinking about how they learn. And use this in your homework, when you assign homework, when you assign tests, when they have to study. They need to get credit for it. We live in this common core environment where kids want grades. They won't use it otherwise. It's an absurdity, but we have to then do that. Give them extra credit for using, for, for thinking, uh, for reflecting on how they think. So we use, you start off, you can use it in a multiple choice format, but really it's the open-ended strategies. So this is Ben. The strategy I used was write it and then check it over a few times. Now that's not really much of a, that's not really a strategy. He is checking it, okay. Um, <laughs> so in the classroom, having strategy, what we call strategy boards or strategy walls. We've had teachers who've created different walls, ones for science, ones for social studies, and, they, and by the end of the year, the kids' strategies are all over the, all the entire classroom is filled with strategies and it's amazing because the kids love it and they learn from it and they can share. That's sort of part of this peer support and peer coaching system. And then, but I want to, com for, uh, to compare that with a student who does have a good, who is reflective. I used the same age. I used a graphic organizer plus all my notes that I had and a textbook. Finally, I used a little imagination. <laughs> so, you want someone to go from, oh, well, I did very little, because clearly he's not, uh, doesn't, he's not self reflective yet. But you want him over the course of the year to get to the point where he does know what a strategy is, he does know how to implement it doesn't know how to learn. And kids get to that point by discussing their personalized strategies in peer mentoring, peer coaching, peers uh, in a classroom. So if you set it up that way and they discuss it and it's like a five minute sh strategy share twice a week in a class, it doesn't take a lot of time, but it can make a huge difference. Um, and most importantly is to make it count because otherwise kids will not use them. So, so to come back to Ben, he said, after going through this metacognitive awareness, the Venn diagrams, the um, metacog questionnaires, um, strategy reflection, he said, when you know what your strengths and weaknesses are, it gives you a different understanding of the work you have to do. It helps you reevaluate what you're doing. If I know I have a paper to write, I'll spend more time planning it out and figuring out how to attack it differently. 
So he's already getting to that point of ownership, like, oh, I know how to break this down. I know how to, how to prioritize. I know how to, um, to focus on what's relevant. I'm not, he, you're starting to unclog that funnel, right? He's starting to begin to understand what he needs to do to attack it differently are the core words that he's used. So really, this is what we want to build. This is the sort of frame for metacognitive awareness, right? You want him to look into the mirror and not see himself as a, as a lion, but see sort of a, a realistic reflection. So know yourself in diagrams, metacog surveys, helping students understand how they learn, strategy reflection sheets we talked about, and we also talked about strategy shares in peer coaching or groups or strategy boards or walls. So these are fairly very, very doable kinds of approaches that you can use in whatever setting you're in to help students to develop that level of metacognitive awareness. Now, it doesn't happen overnight, obviously. It's something that have to, you have to build up over the course of a year or years. So hopefully in a school, if they implement a program uh, an exec of executive function strategies, or some schools are implementing a SMARTS program over multiple grades, and then there's continuity. So you build on this. And so you have kids who are more aware, who self-reflect, and therefore can be more strategic and be empowered to learn. So the next question, so we've talked about what it is, why it's important, why, why these executive function strategies are so critically, uh, so um, an issue in our schools now. We talked about how do we build metacognitive awareness. Now the next question is how do we teach these executive function strategies across the grades, across the content areas, to all students, but especially to students like Ben. So these strategies work for everyone. They're not just special ed strategies but they're critical for students who have learning or attention problems or any other issues or any other challenges in school. And we've actually shown that, so I can't, I'm not going to go into that data, we've actually shown that in a number of our studies, that kids, all kids improve, but kids with learning issues improve more. And so once again, coming back to the paradigm that I'm sort of coming back to keep reminding you that frames it, We've looked at meta, we've talked about metacognitive awareness. Now let's talk briefly about the specific, some specific executive function strategies. And I don't have much time today, so I'm obviously going to, so instead of addressing all of the issues, I'm going to focus on a few. But the important thing is to use metacognitive prompts for teaching all strategies. Because all strategies do not work for all content areas all of the time. So students need to understand what the strategy is that they're going to use. When is the strategy most helpful? And then how should the strategy be used? Those three questions, they have to be asking themselves, they have to be aware of those questions and they have to ask themselves those questions. And as I said earlier, you have to make it count. So getting grades, extra credit for all students at all grade levels who use strategy reflection sheets and strategies for their classwork, for their homework, for their tests. I'm just reiterating what I said a few minutes ago. It's really important, and so that's how we can implement this across grades and across content areas. And so what we want to do is teach kids how to unclog that funnel. So we've begun with metacognitive awareness, so the information goes through, and there's an aha moment for the kids, right? For those of you who can see the details on our unclogged funnel now. Um, because what you're doing is you're teaching them strategies in these areas. How to set realistic and doable goals, how to shift flexibly, how to organize and prioritize, how to access that working memory, and how to then self-regulate and self-monitoring and checking. So I'm going to focus right now, there's no time to deal with, to talk about all of these areas. I'm going to focus specifically on, cognitive, on two that I think are the most critical. One is cognitive flexibility. And all of the work in, in executive function over the years has constantly shown, has continually shown, that cognitive flexibility, flexible thinking, flexible problem solving is at the core of a lot of these executive function processes. And the other one is self-regulation, that's self-monitoring. And I'm going to just talk about a few strategies. So let's talk about what we mean by cognitive flexibility. Um, so just a, a, an analogy, can you all see um, two different ways of, two different, what does this say? You and me, okay, can you all shift it? Can you say it's a perceptual shift, right? So, but you just have this sort of a, a little bit of a doubt about tech. You have to sort of switch in terms of, your, um, in terms of how you're seeing that information. So that's sort of the, para the, so think about that when we talk about cognitive flexibility. Um, and the paradigm that, 
that um, I use to expand is this one of standing at the top of a mountain. So when you're at the top of the mountain, what do you see? The huge expanse, the big picture, right? You don't see the details. You see, you don't see, you see broadly speaking the major themes. But when you're at the bottom of the mountain, so you can see it's very, very broad, it's a very broad vista. But when you're at the bottom, what happens? The details, you really in the leaves, you don't even see the trees, right? It's details and it becomes and, you, and so what, co what the cognitive flexibility is, um, and so you can see it becomes even more broad. So think about your students, right? Eventually they're dealing, the kids who are, when we say he's a bottom-up thinker, this is what he's dealing with all the time. Can you see anything clar clearly there? No. no. Those leaves are very foggy and very misty, right? Um, that's what's happening to our students, the ones who are over-detailed. And the ones who are at the top of the mountain have to be able to shift. So this is what cognitive flexibility is. The ability to shift back and forth between the major themes and the details and back to the major themes and back to the details. And it's focusing on those big ideas and it's ignoring what's irrelevant. So many students get stuck in irrelevant details. You ask them to summarize the information they're reading and they're telling you a lot of irrelevant details. You ask them to write um, and there's a lot of, there's a, either they're over detailed or they can't get to the detail. So the issue with cognitive flexibility is going back and forth and the metacognitive awareness is how do I make that shift? What do I need to do and how am I going to do this? So shifting in terms of multiple meanings, um, Michelle was talking about this on the panel earlier, um, that's sort of a key part, a key component of teaching um, kids Flexible thinking, you start with the language, multi-meaning words. It's a fun way of teaching kids to think flexibly. So, for example, hot dog, two meanings. So you can have, you know, so you have your literal and your figurative meaning, right, of hot dog. Or um, kids make nutritious snacks. <laughs> so, yeah, that one, the, the, the kids making them versus the kids being made into nutritious snacks, right? So you can play, you can have a lot of fun in a classroom, you can have two minutes, I always say, jokes and riddles and puns can be used in every classroom to get kids to think flexibly. But the key is, I mean, kids are faced with puns and riddles all the time, but they don't, you, it's the metacognitive awareness then saying, well now, you, you have to think flexibly about this, you have to think in a different way. So that's shifting, and so in other words, making it explicit. A big part of metacognitive awareness and of, of executive function um, is making these issues explicit. Because pro the process otherwise is not clear to the student, and it's often not clear to whoever's conveying it either. So using five-minute class warm-ups to promote flexible thinking, jokes, riddles, puns, ambiguous language, all can be used very quickly and then, as I say, making it explicit. This is what we're doing. We're asking you, in your, when you read your English, um, your en your English text um, for school, you have to be thinking in different ways about the language. It can't always be uh, literal. It has to sometimes be figurative. And so, actually, it was good. I, I have the exact example here for seeing. <laughs> Michelle, you and I must have communicated in advance, but we also talk about using Amelia Bedelia sat right down and drew the drapes, right? Um, and, the, and so the interesting thing is we teach these issues to kindergartners because Amelia Bedelia is used very frequently. But go beyond kindergarten uh, and or beginning of first grade maybe, everyone forgets about it. Um, and we no longer use these kinds of these wonderful resources that we actually have available to teach kids about this shifting about cognitive flexibility and to do it explicitly. So it's really important that we're having jokes and riddles and puns and um, using multi-meaning words can be very, very helpful, that explicit use. And similarly, um, in terms of our teaching, multiple uses, of course, multi-meaning words, an adjective, a verb, um, a noun, same word, like note, has three different meanings, getting kids to actually write those down. But then it's all very well saying think of three different meanings. 
but to kids, then you have to go that next step. Well, now this is, this is flexible thinking, and this is what you have to do when you have to write a paper, um, when you have to think about different meanings for the words, or when you have to uh, read, um, when you have to think about different words. So teaching kids explicitly to shift perspectives, to self-monitor flexibly when they read, they write, they solve math problems. And so beginning at the earliest grades, even in first grade, something, a strategy we always teach is called the STAR strategy. It's just when, where, why, what, how, um, where. So the five, the, the WHs. But kids can be taught that in terms, we do, with report cards. But if you actually put it into a visual, a STAR, this can be used across the grades, across the content areas. This is a middle school kid, an eighth grader, who had to do, um, read a very complex article about going to Mars but the, the um, STAR strategy could be used to frame it out. It's a very, very simple graphic organizer that can be used to say what the main ideas and what are the details that we're gonna add to it afterwards. Color-coded hi color -coded highlighting is another area where we have to, it's, it's flexible thinking, right? Kids aren't taught to highlight ever. They're just told, okay, well, yeah, read this and you highlight. Well, so what they do is create what I call the yellow book effect, <laughs> right? You can look at kids' papers or books, and they are yellow. And that tells you a lot. That tells you that that kid has no idea about how to sort of sift and sort and prioritize, going from main ideas to details and back, figuring out what's relevant and what's irrelevant. So even in terms of actually explicitly teaching kids to highlight, it's like, okay, we're just going to use two different colors, focus on the main ideas and the details. It's a very challenging thing to teach, because kids who don't sort of get that big idea Often, it's, you have to sort of really probe and push and deep to get them to that point. Um, but, if, but the trouble is that we don't explicitly teach it. Kids are expected to get to that. So once we use this language and these systems and strategies, it can be, it's an important step along that place of saying, now you, you're figuring out what's relevant. And saying to kids, just identify one, you can underline one thing, the man idea, that's it. Not two, not three, but one it really forces them to sort of go to sort of what are those keys. And so their systems, and we have a skim and scoop in reading that we, a strategy that at Wendy Stacey was here, someone will talk about, uh, who's talking this afternoon, will, um, is developed. And then triple no tope, which is a strategy that we use to teach kids actually to, um, to outline, to uh, summarize, to take notes, to, um, and to go further in terms of it's going main idea, details, and what is the strategy. It's a very simple system for, but it's, it's getting a complex process. So it's getting kids, to forcing them to look at, okay, what are the key issues here? So the top of the mountain, I'm standing at the top of the mountain, what are my big ideas? Now I'm in the leaves, the details, but not too many leaves, it's just a few key details. And now what are the strategies I'm going to use if I have to remember this, or if I have to... If I have to implement this in relation to something I write or I read. So it's getting kids, once again, it's that metacognitive awareness. And kids can use this to study. I've taught this to my graduate students. It's changed their whole approach to life where they're reading these complex papers and they use a triple note system and it changes, it, it pushes them, it forces them to, to shift from the top of the mountain to the bottom of the mountain rather than staying down at the bottom all the time. And in math too, shifting between formats, homework is often presented in one way, and kids are quizzed in one way. It's not only math, it's history, it's science. Kids are quizzed by their parents, and they say, I don't understand it. He failed that test, he knew everything. Well, he knew it because the, the parents were asking the question the same way that it was stated in the, in the, in the assignment. But you have to reframe it as tests often do, like, what is 20% of 80? Then the test says 16 is what percent of 80? So it's totally reframed, it's the format. Um, or word problems, or, you know, are so much more complex, but it's, once again, it's simply reframing the information. And that's, once again, going from the big picture to the details and back. So, so coming back to Ben, uh, after learning sort of some of these, fl these strategies and the metacognitive awareness, and that's cognitive flexibility, he says, in smart, I, in smart, I learned that it's hard for me to be flexible. I thought I was being flexible before, but it turns out that I have trouble doing things in new ways. Smart taught me how important it is to try to shift, even when it's tough. 
So that's that level of awareness. He's now saying, I thought I was really good. So that relates to that question about metacognitive awareness. If he completed that questionnaire now, he's going to have a more realistic assessment of his flexibility. And that's um, that aha moment, which is really important in metacognitive awareness. So um, as I said, I was just going to touch on a few strategies, and let me touch on very few, a, a few in self-regulation, um, and then talk about that, how this all interacts with um, you know, just building that persistence and resilience. So self-regulation, which is, you know, translates in, a in an academic sense into self-monitoring and self-checking. Kids often, I see this in classrooms where, you know, the, the teachers at the desk and the kids, fourth graders, are lined up. There's this long line to the back of the room because they're getting, they've, they've done their work very quickly. Now the teacher's got to check what they've done, and that's not the way you check. And the other extreme is the kids who, of course, writing themselves so many sticky notes to remember things and that, that I need to check this and check in this. I mean, it, that's not going to help because, once again, it's not focusing on what's relevant and what's the most important. So self-monitoring and checking is really recognizing and fixing the kinds of mistakes you make. Each individual student has their own personalized checklist. It's not the checklist to Johnny and Ben have different checklists because they all make different mis errors. It's knowing, finding, and correcting errors because kids often know that there's something wrong and they go to the parent or the teacher to find it or it's like, oh well, I can't find it. But they have to find it and they have to correct it and it's asking, does it make sense? That's standing, standing at the top of the mountain and going to the bottom and back. Does my answer make sense? Because kids often do not ask that question in any of the work they do. It's rush and get it in and it's often a lot of gobbledygook. So, so in writing, so I'm just giving you a few um, basics on the, obviously, things like taking a personalized checklist, like what are the errors that I make in writing? Well, I often get my sentences, my structure, my sentences confused. I often mix tenses. I see mixed tenses in so many, even in graduate students who often mix tenses in their papers. Um, so from an early age, if we, for like this was a fourth grader saying, I have to make sure that I don't write, you know, start in the, in the present, then switch to the, to the past and in the future, organization, punctuation, and spelling. And then a mnemonic like stops to remember it. And a, and a, and a visual of a stop sign with an S on the end. Um, or more complicated and with no, um, for at a, at a higher level, like I need to underline the keywords in the question. Did I plan before I wrote, like using an outline or a map or a web? Did I include an introduction and conclusion? Did I add details? Did I proofread? And often if kids, have this sort of internalized checklist and go into even a test with this, okay, these are my five things, and if they create their own personal mnemonic to remember it, they're going to sort of check that. It's like write it down at the beginning and then go back to that at the end. Or in math, estimate the answer. That's the most important thing. It's standing at the top of the mountain. Kids give nonsensical answers often in their calculations. Calculate. Go back, check what you did, and ask, does my answer match my estimate? And then, is my answer reasonable? And so, this is just a mnemonic that they could do. A crazy phrase like, East Coast cold, is it reasonable? Obviously, those of us who've just <laughs> gone through the winter know that it's not very reasonable. But anyway, creating their own crazy phrase or mnemonic, something personal that they'll remember. Or, and on tests, Kids often forget to write their name on their test. They forgot to write their name on their homework and hand, when they hand it in. So something as simple as, did I write my name on the test? Did I follow the directions? Kids often misread the directions and they think they've answered the question and they haven't even begun to. Did I use my strategies? Did I check and make corrections? And a crazy phrase like, never drink sour cocoa. So in other words, things that seem very obvious um, in a test, kids often have trouble with those. Um, and so giving them strategies, making it explicit, making it clear, and having them develop their own strategies that they personalize, that sort of then they own them. So we've talked about the what, the why, two hows. Let's talk about the third how, which is how do we foster self-esteem and persistence and resilience in students. Now, obviously, this is a huge topic, and I have six minutes or something to this, I'm not, um, and so I'm just going to tell you a few, uh, a few of our findings, and as I said, I'll leave the rest to Bob for tomorrow, <laughs> to Barbara's 
<laughs> talk about resilience. But once again, coming back to our paradigm, executive function strategies in relation to that, we sort of then look at the metacognition we've talked about, that when kids are empowered, they understand their learning, they know how to work hard, their, their self-concept improves, their academic self-concept. How do I feel myself as a learner? And we differentiate between academic self-concept and general self-concept. And then that builds resilience and success. So to quote Ben, once he was using these strategies, I could use all my strategies on tests. So the first question didn't start for me and cause my mind to go spinning. That happens to so many kids and I think it probably happens to us as adults too, right? I no longer felt so helpless and I now knew that if I studied for a test, I could do well. So that's this feeling of, I know if I go into a situation, I've mastered it, I've got the strategies and I'm gonna do okay. I'm not gonna be, think I'm gonna do well and then I come out with a fail, failure. I'm not gonna get, because I have some strategies that really work for me. So it's that empowerment. So that of course then builds self-confidence and that then builds self-concept. Um, so, I said I'd tell you a little, just a, a, few of one of our, a few of our studies. As part of our SMARTS program, we've implemented it in multiple schools um, using um, and then evaluated efficacy of the program. We've been five schools in Boston. We've been in a number of um, suburban schools here and nine schools nationally in different levels of evaluation um, over the past few years. And so I just want to tell you a bit about the most recent study that we've been involved in, um, in a school, an urban school, a, a suburban school system here. Yeah. Using our model again, implementing this, this model to teaching metacognition and executive function strategies. We've worked with, the, we've trained the teachers um, and, and in a number of these schools, they've just, what they've done is they've subscribed to the SMARTS program and implemented it. You'll be hearing some, about some of these um, stories tomorrow from teachers across who have been using this program. But so we, so we basically give them the strategies, the lesson plans, the reflection sheets, the handouts, and they then embed it in their curriculum, what works within their curriculum. And so in this study, we were looking at 400 students. Half of the students were, we put into an intervention group that we, we trained, we taught them these executive function strategies, and half of the students were in a control group. Um, a, a subset of the students had special education needs and a subset um, were fine, were, uh, were uh, considered normal achievers, um, whatever that means, as we know. Because <laughs> um, there's no such thing as a normal achiever, right? But kids who had not been identified with special needs. Um, so the students who were in special needs were in special ed classrooms. So I just want you to look at these, this orange versus the blue. Orange is baseline at the beginning of the year and the blue is at the end, towards the end of the year. We had like eight months where they were teaching smarts. It really became, it really is less when you think about a school year. And you can see there were significant gains in the intervention group. So our first, this first set of bars, this is our intervention group in special education. This is our control group in special education. They actually deteriorated a little. It wasn't significant, but it is a little. I'll tell you a bit more about that. And in the general ed intervention, significant, yeah, those were significant changes, and, the, and the, the, inter, the control group just stayed at the same level. This, 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 even though it's not significant, in the comparison group of special ed kids, these were all in kids in special ed classrooms. What it's telling you is over the course of the year, if they're not taught strategies, she start declining. So in other words, it's not treading water to even be in a special ed classroom. These strategies are really important um, to teach. Um, they make a difference. And same with effort. We showed the same patterns. You can see in the special education students, and we, by effort, we mean focused effort. We're not talking about, oh, well, they say they're working three hours in their home. It means focused effort um, that sort of that's, that has a, an end result. And in the general education intervention group, there was also significant change and no changes in the control. So it tells you that it works, that these strategies really are effective. And then we also looked, and I haven't put all the numbers in there because they're very confusing, but these are statistics. This is a statistical path analysis. These arrows mean these significant interactions. So our SMARTS executive function strategies are interacting with effort, with cognitive flexibility and multiple pathways, and also building resilience. And so we showed this statistically. These were all significant, these findings. So it shows that, in fact, this is not just our sort of belief system. It does actually 
work, it makes a difference, and the core, as we believe, are these str strategies that can be implemented um, by all of you in your settings. And so a few quotes to end. Smarts help me shift perspectives and develop strategies to understand myself better. This is Ben again. I wish I had learned this stuff when I was younger. I could have used it during my entire academic career. Now, isn't that interesting? Certainly self-reflective. This is a kid who's now developed, certainly metacognitively aware. And I just want to give you some two quotes from teachers. I've seen students apply smart strategy in history, English, science. It works across the board. And another teacher said, so, and I think this is really relevant, so often students just want to be told the right answer and spit it back at you when it's time for the test. This is what, unfortunately, our standards-based education and common core has done. I think it's really important for students to be more engaged with their own learning and thinking process. Smart help students do this. So it's the engagement, it's the empowerment, it's the metacognitive awareness. And so we've talked about all of these issues to today. Very briefly, as I said, and you certainly read more and learn more um, from, uh, from our work, but what is an executive function? Why do these difficulties have major impact? And then the three hows I addressed. And to finish, I just want to finish again with a quote from Nelson Mandela, because I think this is what strategies do. And this was his belief right through those 27 years that he was, he was in solitary confinement on Robben Island in in South Africa, he said, I am the master of my fate, I'm the captain of my soul. These aren't his own words. This is actually from a 12th century um, uh, writer that he's quoting. But this is what strategy instruction does for kids. It helps them to understand that they are masters of their fate and that empowers them to learn how to learn. And if we can achieve that, and if on Monday morning you go back from this conference with a few ideas that you can implement that help you to give that kid that empowerment, then I think we've been successful. So thank you very much.